Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome. I'm Jennifer LaRue. I'm the Director of Public Programs here at the Mark Twain House and Museum in Hartford, Connecticut. And I am so excited to be hosting uh, this lunchtime for us um, talk uh, about this wonderful new book, The Gilded Edge by Catherine Prendergast. And she's going to be in conversation with Lindsay Fitzharris. Uh, it's going to be fun. Uh, we just spent a little bit of time together in the green room. And uh, you are in for a treat, let me tell you. Um, before your treat, though, you have to listen to me talk for a couple more moments. Um, I just have a little bit of housekeeping to do. I want to thank you for joining us, first of all. And I want to thank you for joining in the chat. Looks like there's a lot of lively conversation going on already. Um, it's nice to see where everybody's from. We were just talking about the fact that uh, for all the downsides of this virtual world we live in, we have been able to make friends and attract um, connections all over the world in, in this virtual life. So uh, that's a silver lining so far as I and the Mark Twain House are concerned. So keep chatting away, please, throughout the program. But if you have a question, we're going to have a Q&A session toward the end of the program. And if you do have a question for either of the authors, uh, rather than put it in the chat, if you would do me the favor, please, of putting it down in the ask a question area that you see at the bottom center of your screen. That will make that part of the program go just a lot easier. So thank you in advance for that. While we're looking at that part of the screen, I'd just like to draw your attention to that long green bar right above the Ask a Question area, right under my face, that says, your support is vital to the Mark Twain House and Museum. Please donate here. Um, we have been really proud of ourselves as a staff. Um, I'm very proud of our staff uh, for the work we've done to get ourselves through this pandemic and to stay active and engaged with our communities and audiences. Um, and we've done, oh, I don't know, something like 150 of these uh, crowdcasts since the pandemic began. But it has not been easy for us financially. Um, and though we uh, are feeling pretty strong and feel like we've been really careful about how we manage our money, uh, I'd say the more the merrier. If you're able to help us out in any way by making a donation of any amount, I just want you to know that on behalf of the staff and the Board of Trustees of the museum, uh, every single penny is put to very, very good use, and we appreciate every single penny very deeply, so thank you for that. Another piece of housekeeping I'd like to uh, draw your attention to uh, at the very top of the chat, and I will repost it once I finish talking, is a link through which you can purchase a signed copy of The Gilded Edge. And um, let me show you this book. Uh, Catherine is signing copies for everybody who orders them. Now, we know you can purchase this book elsewhere. We are no dummies. But I want to let you know that if you do purchase it through us, first of all, you do get a signed copy, which is not the case with every vendor. And also, your purchase benefits the Mark Twain House and Museum. So that's another way that you can support us, and we deeply appreciate that. Uh, when I come back to help with the Q&A, we'll be having a little book giveaway. Uh, Catherine and Lindsay very generously have offered to give one attendee a copy of each of their books. So one person will get a copy of The Gilded Edge and of uh, Lindsay's book, The Butchering Art. Um, so uh, I will be, we'll, we'll be doing a drawing uh, when I come back with the Q&A. So that's kind of fun. And thank you both for your generosity in, in making that possible. I want to thank our sponsors. Uh, like all of our virtual programs, this afternoon's program is sponsored by the Wish You Well Foundation and by Connecticut Public. WNPR, and it's produced in part with support honoring the legacy of Frank Lord, our beloved uh, late trustee. I don't want to leave without reminding you or telling you for the first time about our annual virtual gala on November 4th, right around the corner. This is our major fundraiser for the year. Uh, the theme is Mark Twain around the world. And we have such a lineup of speakers um, making appearances uh, during our virtual gala. Uh, Nelson DeMille, Jill Sobule, Kevin Kwan, David Baldacci, Azar Nafisi, many, many of our other friends. So um, I'm going to repost this in the chat as well. But if you can check out marktwainhouse.org slash gala, uh, you can learn about all those guests and about the amazing auction items that you can uh, take a look at as part of the gala. So I want to now introduce our two speakers. Uh, Dr. Lindsay Fitzharris is a best-selling author, television host, and medical historian with a doctorate from Oxford University. Her debut book, The Butchering Art, won the Penn E.O. Wilson Award for Literary Science and has been translated into 20 languages. Dr. Fitzharris writes regularly for a variety of publications, including the Wall Street Journal, Scientific American, The Guardian, The Lancet, and New Scientist. 
her new television series on the Smithsonian Channel, The Curious Life and Death of dot, 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 explores some of the most mysterious deaths in history. That sounds awesome. Catherine Prendergast is a professor of English at the University of Illinois at Urbana-Champaign, a Guggenheim Fellow, and a Fulbright Scholar. Interviewed by NPR and New York Magazine, she has written on battles over school desegregation, anxieties over the global spread of English, and recognition of disability rights. Originally from New Jersey, she can now be found amidst the cornfields of the Midwest with her husband and son. And before I bring them on screen, I just want to also add that uh, Lindsay Fitzharris is going to be join is joining us um, from England. So should there be any uh, laps or gaps or anything, it might have to do with the fact that she's across the ocean from us. Lindsay, welcome. Thank you so much. <laughs> and here comes Catherine. There we go. <laughs> Hi, Hi, Catherine. Everyone. Welcome. So, uh, Lindsay, will you let me know when it's time to come back up and help with the, yep, the Q&A, please? Absolutely. Okay, very that. good. Well, right. have fun. I'm going to sit back and enjoy with everybody else, and I'll be back in a little bit. All right. Thanks. Thank you. You know, I'm always, every time, you know, people kind of prep the audience to say, Lindsay's coming in from England, I think they expect like a really posh British accent and they're so disappointed when this Midwest Chicago accent comes out of my mouth. But anyway, everybody, thank you so much for joining. I've been watching on the side screen all the places you're coming from, Los Angeles, Indiana, Virginia, Belgium, Boston. I mean, you guys are representing from everywhere. So really appreciate you coming out. Um, it's really hard right now for debut authors, especially during the pandemic. So all this kind of support is just really wonderful. And I am telling you, this book, guys, is my favorite nonfiction book of 2021, hands down, Catherine. I'm serious. I just finished this the other day and I burst into tears the moment I finished it. It brought out my frustrations. It brought out, you know, heartbreak. And we're going to talk all about, you know, the core of it, which is about women's lives at the turn of the 20th century, which really resonate about women's lives even today, I think, you know. And, um, you know, part of, part of this was uh, Catherine and I talked a little bit before, guys, about how we were going to run this. And we were originally going to have like a little presentation by her. But for technical issues, we can't do that. So I'm going to start. My first question really was. George Sterling's a bit of a wanker, right? But oh, most oh, people wanker. aren't going to understand that. So we'll get to him being a wanker in a minute. But can you just explain broadly what this story is and who the key players are and, you know, how you got inspiration for it? Sure. But first, I'm going to explain uh, how I came to know Lindsay Fitzharris, right? So um, when I was starting to write this book, I was reading a lot of narrative nonfiction and I picked up the butchering art and uh, she had me from a surgery that had a 300% fatality rate. And <laughs> the humor matched with the gore. I was like, that's it. That's it. I would be so happy to write such a gripping book. And then as it turns out, she was visiting from England up the road in Bloomington, Illinois. Brando, right? <laughs> college right so my buddies and i piled in a car and so we got to meet there so it's it's really a pleasure it's a strong illinois oh, connection here i love um, it as for carmel like I, I the question was how did i get to write about this well tell us a little bit about what the story is because people are oh, coming yeah. to this event and don't know you know i didn't know anything about this story and and guys yeah. i'm telling you you know I, I don't have a lot of time to read these days i couldn't put this book down um, and it has nothing to do with anything that I thought I would find interesting. It was written in such a compelling and gripping way. And the story is, is really fantastic. So just tell us what the core of that story is. Okay. So for those of you who are coming in from somewhere else and haven't been, Carmel is an immensely uh, wealthy and yet shrouded in kind of a bohemian chic enclave on the Pacific coast. Um, if you go today, you will have such a great time. Beautiful restaurants, lovely galleries. It has this great artistic past and an incredibly gorgeous beach. And the legend of Carmel is that it was started about a hundred and some years ago by these bohemian writers who just, you know, stumbled on this captivating landscape and decided nowhere but here can we make great art. 
Okay. So, and what I found out when I just scraped a little, that wasn't the case. It was actually a land profit, uh, a for-profit development scheme. And they were using Bohemians as kind of a chic. If you think about the influencers of today, these were people who were paid to move to Carmel to write about it, to get their friends to write about it, to kind of like put people through sort of timeshare tours of fun stuff and then give the big pitch. And um, it all fell apart in what has often been called um, a cyanide cult. Um, but as I found out, that's not really accurate either. The cyanide is accurate, the cult part isn't. So that captivated me and started my research. Yeah, and and at the core of it are these uh, are these characters who. And by the way, when I say characters, guys, it's totally a true story. It's it's a wild story, but it is a hundred percent true. But the main actors in this story are people that you might recognize, like uh, Jack London. He's in it, you know. So there's some very famous writers, and most of the writers' names who you'll recognize are male writers, right? Because oh, yeah. the, their legacy is the one that we kind of all remember, and that's really at the heart of your frustrations in bringing this book to life, isn't it? Yeah. So I I initially started with the male writers because that's where the records are, and then I ran into um, this letter in the Bancroft Library in Berkeley, California, in which this poet who's uh, 26 or 25 at that point writes her boyfriend about an abortion she's self administering while she's self administering it, and this was part of the Carmel set, and I was like what kind of woman does that, you know? And I started to like, I mean, the guys, you know, I tried to write about them, but they were so awful, pretty quickly, <laughs> yeah. warmly, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you know, that, that I was like, huh, this letter is buried. And it's, it's fascinating because we have so many few, uh, so few yeah. first person accounts of women going through abortion, which was just a fact of life. Um, yeah. And at the time, you could just buy the drugs at the drugstore, which she does, and go home. Mm -hmm. And uh, they were very dangerous. She was risking her life. They had noxious ingredients like turpentine in them. Even their legal ingredients like tansy and, you know, could could dispatch you. So yeah. this was an incredibly risky endeavor. And what I quickly realized was this group of bohemians who were living this alternative social code um the sexual part of it the consequences were being carried by the women almost entirely and that their story was manipulated and used to sell the colony to others so i kept digging yeah i mean that account I, guys it appears on the first page of this book this letter and it's extraordinary because as a medical historian, you know, we don't come across a lot of firsthand accounts of patients regardless. We certainly don't come across firsthand accounts from women as much. And then an abortion on top of it, it's an extraordinary document in and of itself. And this wasn't her first, this was the first, she, this was her second, she had done a surgical one before. Does she pass comment on the differences between those two, just out of curiosity? So she does not publicly comment on either of them. Um, she wrote about the first one in a, a very searing poem that was not published during her life, but that the married guy by whom she had the second abortion <laughs> publishes posthumously, which is kind of a, you know, yeah. a weird flex. Yeah, that is, yeah. Yeah, so the only way we know about these things are sort of hints and rumors, except for this letter, um, and, you know, what you find in the archives, but it's not part of her, you know, story as such. She is blamed for the cyanide cult for kicking that off because she dies in the house of the two main players of the colony, George and Carrie Sterling, who are about 10 years older than her. And she is at this point a very renowned poet. She has published in every uh, journal of the West. She is a uh, been on front pages. She has uh, published a story in the Saturday Evening Post, which at that time had a circulation of a million because magazines were expanding. So it's right. funny. Some people ask me, like, why are you writing about these unknown women? And after looking at her face in the newspaper, all these women, yeah. like, she wasn't unknown. Not very unknown. Yeah. So how did she become unknown? Yeah, that is, that is true. I mean, it's like she she kind of burned bright in her own life and was largely forgotten, or there was this myth that was sort of built around her. And her, her name, by the way, is Nora uh, May French, um, or sorry, French May, but no, May Nora French. May yeah. French yeah. <laughs> Nora May French. And one of the things I was talking to Catherine about before this event was my aunt was also a poet writing around this time, sort of turn of the 20th century. She died when I was about 10 years old, but 
her, I was always told that her strict grandfather or father, who was this German man, didn't think it was appropriate for women to publish, especially in a newspaper. And so she wrote under all these pseudonyms and I don't know what her pseudonyms were. So I don't know how to find all that. But I, my grandma did have one of her poems um, framed and I'm not going to read it or anything, but it's one of these things that, you know, I've kept this whole time. And when she got married, she ended up giving up the writing because she was then a married woman. And so it really reminded me of this key figure who ends up killing herself or maybe being murdered. We're going to get to that uh, a little bit later on. But she was she was really caught up in all of these these male forces right around her and was really kind of pushed towards this this sort of fate of hers, this terrible uh, thing that happens. But um, but she was a very accomplished woman, wasn't she, even at the time of her death? Yeah, she started she started publishing when she was 11. I mean, she had, you know, several bylines in the Los Angeles Times. She uh, she was, you know, phenomenal. And not only that, had the respect of poets, not just sort of a lot of women were writing at the time. But um, yeah. she was definitely a cut above. Um, now, it's funny. Yeah. You know, when you told me about your aunt, I was just so move because that is such the story, right? You get married and then you have to put the pen down. And yeah. this is part of why she refused to get married. She could have married out of her, you know, impoverished artistic life several times yeah. because she was also beautiful mm -hmm. um, and gorgeous with these kind of like silent movie star eyes, you know, <laughs> yeah. and uh, that was part of the captivating, you know, legend they built around her after her death. But um, she, you know, she chose what to publish. She chose what to publish under her name. She, the Saturday Evening Post thing, she, she published anonymously for, you know, reasons because it's kind of salacious, but she right. needed the money. And so she was really someone who like thought a lot about her career. And she was frank that she's, you know, has spates of depression, but mm -hmm. that they are never as lasting as her joys. The other thing about her that's fascinating is that that she's the grandniece of Henry Wells, who founded uh, Wells Fargo and American Express, and the grandfather of the ninth governor of Illinois, Augustus French. And so this is someone who was born into a lineage. And uh, for reasons you'll find out in her book, her father um, moves them to California, where a ranch fails. And from then on, she's destitute and, uh, you know, has to sort of grow up into her own and, in fact, is supporting her family. Uh, who's hit on hard times, so to speak. But after she dies, none of the like 100 or so mm -hmm. articles that report on her death are Henry Wells or the governor mm -hmm. of Illinois mentioned. Yeah, because of, in the stigma with suicide and, and the fact, yeah, I mean, there was a lot of, so there, there was, as you say, Nora was at the center of this. And at the time for death, she was pregnant with this guy, George Sterling's baby, we Spoiler. think. Spoiler. Oh, sorry, sorry. <laughs> I'm just giving motives to you. I'm not gonna go into like, you know, I'm not gonna ask you some of the obvious questions. Sorry guys, that, that is a spoiler. Um, but but there was an affair. And, and one of the things that you really struggle, one of the things I love actually about this book is that you are very open about your research frustrations. So, you know, you put yourself right there. So there are moments in this book where you're reading the story and there's Catherine telling you exactly, you know, how frustrating it is to go into these archives and to try to piece together these women's lives when there's such incomplete records and stuff. And you said, um, in order to tell this story at all, I love this, I've had to fill in some cracks with my imagination. Either we connect the dots to make sense from the sparse records available, or we get silence, or we just wind up writing about men over and over and over because their records are the ones that get preserved. And I just absolutely love that. And you know, when you're looking at at the various uh, frustrations, tell tell me about the archival frustrations first of all, because you're you have an academic background. You're doing this commercial yeah. book. There's all kinds of like different things that you have to do as a commercial writer. So talk us through some of that. Well, okay. First of all, you know, uh, before I had the agent that I had selling the book, I had another agent who eventually was like, "Can't you just write a, a biography of Jack London? There are like five of those." And I was at one point, <laughs> I was like. No can do. I mean, I could do, but why would I do, you know? So I really chose to, you know, tell a different tale. Now, as I was going through the archives, Nora Mae French and a lot of her female compatriots are buried in collections that are named after their male friends because, 
you know, that's what gets preserved. That's what gets sold to archives. So uh, all, all the way archives work is they don't work under subject, they work under provenance. So if letters came from the Harry Laffler connection, her married boyfriend she had the abortion with, you know, that's who her letters are in, even though his biggest publication of note is her poems, a book of her poems after she dies. That's so crazy. I am yeah. <laughs> it's just so, yeah. It doesn't sit right, does it? Yeah, and what I was finding was that that letter about her abortion to Harry, eventually I realized there's a page missing, you know, and she was just about to get in to him, you know, mm -hmm. <laughs> at that point. And it, this was a pattern, and there in the Berg, um, in the New York Public Library, there's a very um, interesting and uh, well-known collection called the Berg, and they also have Realia, like Charlotte Bronte's traveling writing desk, or you know, so and so Dickens' spectacles. So it's a wonderful place to do work, um, except at the time they didn't allow you to take many photos. So I'm having to, you know, type. <laughs> And now you will literally minutes. sit there and, and record. Thank you, I'm high just... school typing. Yeah. So uh, this and woman, I... guys, literally sat. I mean, the, the amount of work that has gone into this book is. Ext... I mean, how many years did this take you to write? Seven. Okay. Seven. So I'm in the Berg, and the, these letters between George Sterling and his. Um, he was best friends with Jack London, and he was the protege of Ambrose Spierce. You may remember occurrence at Owl Creek Bridge, reading that in middle school if you're American of a certain age. So, you know, he wrote to Bierce all the time. He was so sycophantic. Bierce was going to make him the next Keats. He even offered Bierce his, he had six sisters. He offered the youngest one, who was 15, in marriage. Mm -hmm. She's 150 pounds. She's just great, you know. Yeah. But anyway, their handwritten correspondence often has like cross outs where Nora Mae French was mentioned and I, or ripped. And I was like, what is going on here? So that the more they tried to cover their tracks, the more um, tenacious yeah. I became. Yeah, women aren't forgotten. They get buried and they get buried very actively. So yeah, um, yeah they're not hidden so much as suppressed. Yeah, I, and I think that, you know, you, you hit that point so well. And, you know, again, apologies for that that spoiler, but one of the, the reasons why I, I bring Don't tell, guys. You, you're in the know. <laughs> send me the hate mail on Twitter. Um, but anyway, um, the reason I, I brought it up was it's one of those episodes that you're like, a, it's like forensic detectives for like really nerdy people because you're like, you're smelling the documents. You're, you're taking everything into account. Like, where were these documents? Where Whose hand were they in? What was going on here? And there is, you know, as you say, you have to connect the dots. Um, and it's weird as an academic, when you're coming from an academic position, yeah. writing a book like this can feel a little scary. <laughs> I could see that. I could see the academic fear in your eyes, you know, mm -hmm. um, and you and you never shake that part of yourself, you know, but it also ends up making a really excellent book because this is research to the teeth, even though, as you say, you have these obstacles that you have to overcome. But I mean, the way that you are piecing all this together is absolutely fascinating. And how did when did you decide to put yourself in the book? Okay, so that's a great question. I mean, um, first, let me say, in uh, terms of the forensics work, a recent person I did an event with described it as working a cold case. And that's absolutely, this is kind of a detective story where I'm the yeah. detective, and it's 100 years old. And I'm like, what the heck is it? What the heck is it? <laughs> so, you know, and writing to people, like, when I'm in the archives, texting my friends, going, guys, look at this. This is crazy. <laughs> so, um, but the academic part of it, you know, while you have to do some real um, craft work to, to change the way you present the data, in terms of collecting the data, I relied on my academic work. Um, when I teach qualitative methods to my graduate students, my t-shirt is, everybody lies. Everybody lies. They yeah. actually lie to the newspapers. So sometimes when I read, you know, nonfiction books that only rely on newspapers, I'm like, okay. Yeah. I call it the first draft of history yeah. for a reason, right? Yeah. They lied to each other. They told each other to burn their letters regularly. Mm -hmm. um, they were very conscious of building their reputations, both in 
time and in the hereafter. Ambrose Bierce told Sterling, everybody should burn their letters. You know, they they knew they were being talked about all the time and they knew they would be talked about. So there was a lot of manipulating going on. So I relied on a process we call in academia triangulation of data, where if I found something, I tried to corroborate it. And here's the thing about the Sinai cult, where the myth of Carmel was that they being diehard bohemians, even though they were actually real estate agents, <laughs> they, they all carried cyanide on their person so that they could dispatch themselves when the really? thrill of youth and life had faded, right? That's the story that they told and that Nora Mae French was the first to take that option. And that, that wasn't true. It had exactly one source, which was the woman who was uh, married to uh, one of the artists, and she was the oldest person to survive. So her old oral history becomes definitive. And yet, it's not corroborated by anything. And it's clear, you know, once you look at the record, that there is no coordination among mm. these suicides. There's definitely a sadder, sicker, and related reason they all wind up dead from Sinai. Yes. But yeah. it's not like it was a plan from the beginning. Mm -hmm. I mean, and, and to get to that, so so this poet Nora, she dispatches herself or maybe not. Now, the, the problem is that there's only one witness to this, which is Carrie Sterling, the wife of the man that she is having allegedly this affair with. And it's a weird story, right? Like Carrie says that she sees Nora flushed and she gets into bed and like holds her and then doesn't realize she's been dead for an hour. It's just utterly bizarre. Tell us yes. about that whole scene. Okay, so that I discovered on microfilm through Carrie's uh, Carrie's report of everything that happens winds up being a front state page story in the San Francisco papers, and they gave her several column inches to tell this, as kind of as she related it to the inquest. The jury was quickly impaneled right afterwards, and that's as much of an investigation as you get. It wraps, you know, in twenty four hours. So one of the things she says is that you know she foamed at the mouth and became still, and then you know, she seemed cold. So Carrie got in bed to hold her, you know, for an hour. And then she realizes she's dead, even though she had been dead for an hour. And then she runs for help. And I'm like, I mean, at this point, this is where I start going into Lindsay's territory. You know, yeah. how fast I might act. What people are doing, like, can you really hold a dead body for an hour without realizing that it's dead? There might be people that are tuning in tonight that might have views on that if they're like following me. They might, that might be in their like wheelhouse. But that seemed like a very, that seemed very suspicious. And I'm not going to yeah. ask you the question that I know everybody asks, which is, what do you think? Did right. Carrie kill Nora or did Nora kill herself? But what I do want to know is, do you have a strong opinion and, and, and how sure are you of that opinion? Like, is it a knowable thing, do you think? I don't think it's knowable. And I started right. out with a really strong opinion and it actually, um, to kind of write the story and to be non-biased, I divested myself and, you know, start of, of any yeah. opinion really. And so when I say, I'm not 100% sure, I mean it, you know? So what I love though, is I'm even starting to get letters from people who tell me they're, oh, you know, I yeah. found this old letter from Upton Sinclair. I think this means da, 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 da. So And don't I you think people's biases like must play into that? Cause like for, for me, I mean, the, one of the questions I also want to ask was like, I, I identify with both these women for different reasons at different points in their story. Who do you identify with most? Right. So I first, of course, identify with Nora because I'm a writer and um, I grew up in a kind of hippie background. And uh, so so part of what I'm I'm looking at here is an, a group of really close knit people, kind of like a Petri dish that, you know, form this sort of alternative society. They're all sleeping with each other <laughs> there. Um, and then horrible things happen. But because you're so into your own legend of the group at that point that the emotional toll doesn't hit till years and even decades later not fully and and mm -hmm. so this reminds me very much of a group i was um part of in high school who all moved when this one guy moved you know i mean it was seriously the same geographic <laughs> yeah and and uh, one married the other sister, another two married sisters. I mean, it really, I, I saw this story. And I was like, I know these people. So yeah. Nora Mae French, I recognized immediately. Carrie had a little trouble with um, because she did give up her 
career for her husband and she did she was kind of one of the new women who went out to work but mm -hmm. once she's married that's it you know and uh and but then my uncle was reading the book and he is like you know first generation irish and he, she was the only person he related to and i realized this is my grandmother this is my grandmother whose name oddly enough is nora who grew up in an industrial boarding school in ireland you know got tb survived you know what one of those places that's on the like you can get compensation yeah. for having been there right moves to america marries up decides i am not does not romanticize poverty in any way shape or form mm -hmm. and rolls her eyes at any pretense of doing that and i'm like that's who carrie is someone who right. had to crawl out of a bad situation in her mother's boarding house in the oakland docks and is rolling her eyes at the pretension of it all. I mean, I really identified with Carrie because in, in brief, I, I and you know this, Kathy, I, I went through a terrible divorce in 2015. And for people out there who don't know, I, I my husband literally disappeared and I found myself facing deportation. I was financially broke. I was so dependent on this person and I thought, oh my God, it's, it's 2015. I have a PhD from Oxford and I am completely at the mercy of this man who I can't even find. I don't even know where he's gone. And so I really identified with her, her, you know, being married to this husband who's running around with all these women. She finds herself in this really destitute, she, she, she takes, I won't give any more spoilers, but she does take some power back um, yes. in this story. But, you know, it's it, women, you know, we like to think that we've come really far and in a lot of ways we have, but there's still a lot of echoes. I think that if you pick up this book and you've been through sort of a traumatic relationship, you, this book is going to really resonate with you in different kinds of ways. You might feel more with Nora, you might feel more with Carrie, but there's a lot of that going on. Yeah, I mean, I, there were times where I pondered like Team Nora, Team Carrie um, shirts, you know, and <laughs> their faces on it for a book launch that I'm not yeah. going to have because of COVID. They're but both the, sympathetic, though. They're both but victims. They both right? are, right? Of, they of both these are. Men. And they're pitted against each other just through, you know, essentially patriarchy. And how dare we in the year of our Texas Lord 2021, where a bounty yeah. can be put on women's heads yeah. for doing exactly what Nora did yeah. in the first chapter. And, and out of out of complete desperation, you know, at this out time of, to be unmarried and to, to be in that predicament and then to risk your life and to be demonized for it or for that poem to be published without her, her consent is also, it's such a strange horrible thing really i mean her i'm glad you passed it away but then yeah you have yeah, to her explicit non-consent and you know uh, she didn't want harry laffler to be part of it he was very yeah. abusive he was married he was you know he was a serial rake i mean he is a yeah. rake <laughs> so yeah. all the things you personally are so you know whatever your your uh your ex-boyfriends you're like you know like <sighs> you know, you'll connect, you can, you can hate read these guys. <laughs> yes. Oh, I, I did that. That's why I said George Sterling's a bit of a wanker, you know? Oh, um, nice. But, you know, I actually going back to correspondence, the, the amount of letters that you've uncovered are, I love letters from this period. We don't write letters anymore. And I'm wondering what you think about the challenges historians are going to have in a hundred years, because although we like to think of digital communication as forever, it's not really right. You know, if I had videotaped myself in the nineties saying something that I wanted to keep forever, nobody has a VCR anymore. So, right. you know, how is our, our, our kind of fragmented way that we communicate? Like it's going to be harder in some ways to piece together people's internal lives. You know, and then the, the point is that there are always human actors who are manipulating what eventually makes it into whatever record people find later and I was just like I was so mad at my uncle because you know what through writing this book I became more interested in my grandmother's life and mm -hmm. he's like yeah I throwed away all those letters this man kept every letter from like professional people that he worked with yeah. but yeah. in the domestic sphere you know mm -hmm. women's lives are considered ephemeral and inconsequential and that's really you know the point that angered me more and more um as i wrote this book as women brilliant women friends of mine were going through terrible struggles and or dying and i was watching you know where their lives and work went and uh i was like we have a problem here and we still yeah. have it and it's going to be a problem for the future I mean, and it's it, not to mislead anybody. It's not just all about the men. One of my favorite lines in this book is, um, 
it's not just the men who bring shovels when it comes to burying women. I mean, that uh, was an incredibly powerful line. So talk to us about toxic female relationships in this book. Yeah. There was there, wasn't there? Yeah. So there is epic frenemy stuff in this. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, yeah, and um, you can picture this playing out on Instagram almost. Like, I mean, there's like oh, a feel, yeah. a modern feel to the the, the relationships here. A hundred percent of of women offering each other as support, you know, when things go wrong, but they're actually, you know, stabbing them in the back in other ways. I mean, and so, you know, I wish um, we had, you know, there, there are some models of women supporting other women, but let's put it this way. Women at the time could play only the limited roles that they had. And it was, mm -hmm. you know, uh, muse or, uh, you know, or, uh, you know, nagging wife. Yeah. Uh, yeah. You know, Madonna Whore thing on a national scale. And that's, that's all. And what's interesting find. about the women is like, they, some, like Carrie finds herself very much in judgment of, you know, some of these, these unmarried women, but then the, the viewpoints do change a bit. And you see that yes. like once you're on the other side or like Charmaine London, who, you know, find, finds herself maybe uh, viewing things a little bit differently. Also, by the way, that beautiful, beautiful, oh, <laughs> the way that she would say beautiful was beautiful, beautiful. Well, and I'll just know that Charmian in her diaries um, denoted every time they had sex or almost every time is by saying lolly. She had different words for everything. <laughs> and her diaries are so small and tiny, tiny handwriting. I took a picture, picture to show my son, like, this is my day right now. <laughs> I'm trying yeah. to read <laughs> Honestly, and you know, people lie through their own diaries. That's what I found out. You know, oh, yeah, I can imagine. I mean, yeah, we, we lie on right. social media. Social medias are basically diaries now, right? Like the way we, right? I mean, I saw someone, you know, post a, a beautiful photo of himself and said, "It's a writing day," and I'm like, "Bullshit! It's a writing day." <laughs> no, no writer puts any makeup on. I mean, this is the first time I've gotten dressed in literally months. Like, I never put a bra on anymore. <laughs> like, exactly. Nothing, you know. So I only do it for virtual events. So I just, I, it is funny when, when people, we, we all do it, we all do it. And, mm -hmm. and people certainly did it in the past. And then the other frustration you said is the burned letters and the fact that, you know, sometimes you only have half the dialogue and you really have to kind of overcome all of this, but you do it in a very rigorous academic way, but in an entertaining way in the book, but, but there is a lot of rigorous academic work behind what you're doing. Thank you. Thank you. So, and I'm, I'm also, someone said, even today, women can be the best supporters of other women and also the worst. Oh, so true, <laughs> That Gail. is very true, Gail. That is, uh, <laughs> after this Ooh. event, I'm going to talk about Catherine behind her back. <laughs> <laughs> I will say <laughs> Lindsay is someone <laughs> who is a okay. model of supporting other women writers, you know? Well, you I, don't I, this this yeah. book, is, I, I'm, I cannot stop thinking about this book. And also go back to that that weird, the, the story about when Nora dies, one of the, my favorite parts was the psychic corro corroborating this, yes. this event. So tell us about that, because it's too- Yeah, so one of Carrie's friends, you know, uh, who's got connections to the newspaper, manages to her get her, a friend whose veracity cannot be challenged. <laughs> so that a dream in which Nora May French reached out to her at the moment in which she took the poison. I was like, you have God. That is amazing. Listen, Catherine, if, I ever get, if, if someone thinks I've murdered somebody, make sure you get that psychic in the newspaper oh, corroborating right. my version of the events. I mean, uh -huh. that was that was really funny. I mean, and, and I think in a lot of ways, well, I don't, I don't know as I say this, but, you know, could it have only happened then? Could, they, could Would there have been a better investigation today? Or, you know, it's just such a strange thing that they didn't really dig into it. They just kind of took her word for it that this is how it happened that she got into bed and held this dead person for an hour and nothing for whom i mean when they found brian laundry remember that uh gabby petita story here oh yeah they found the bones of nine other people so apparently they can find things when they look <laughs> But, you know, and, and Gabby Petito disappears and all these indigenous women have disappeared and nobody's been looking. So, yeah. you know, the Nora Mae French, who's sort of like expelled from her family, unmarried, you know, becomes all of a sudden in death, just this beautiful girl. She, they used her live and they used her dead that they can burnish Carmel's image with. Mm. Um, yeah. I, think I mean, her status as, as this kind of unmarried woman and, you know, the, as you're saying, like there wasn't, maybe there wasn't an incentive to go deeper. And Carrie was of yes. a certain 
class and people didn't want to get the Sterlings kind of involved in that, that, you know, yeah, they, you know, hung around, or not, yeah. they hung around with the governor, the mayor. I mean, they, uh, George Sterling um, was vice president in 1904 of the biggest, second biggest land developer, the East Bay. And they were the people who uh, built up the Piedmont. Mark Twain drop here, um, which was at that point only like a sulfur springs with a hotel, but they made it wealthy residential and became the city of millionaires. And Mark Twain visited. I like that Mark Twain drop. <laughs> Mark Twain drop. I, I, I just there. looked at the clock. Also, I have to bring the Mark Twain house back in because there's yep. going to be some questions. Our our conversation is already kind of slightly reaching an end. So, guys, if you have questions, make sure you yay for the Mark Twain drop. Uh, come in and, and leave your questions, and Catherine and I will be happy to answer them. So, over to Mark Twain house. Oh wow! What a fun. <laughs> fascinating conversation. I was just musing on the fact that we're talking about pretty grim stuff here, but it's like really a lively and so much laughing and stuff. So thank you so much. I know our audience has been really digging it too. Um, so we do have some good audience questions uh, and I'm going to jump in with Mallory, who's my colleague at the Mark Twain house. And I have to give Mallory um, kudos for, this is her idea to, to contact you all and, and have a talk about this. So thank you, Mallory, for that. Um, Mallory says, what fascinating topics you both chose to write about. Can you tell us a little bit about your next book projects? Oh, God. <laughs> oh, God. Can we skip that one? <laughs> <laughs> uh, I mean, do you have a next book project, Kat? I do. So the Guggenheim grant in 2014 funded um, research on four very related sites. And I very early on realized I needed to do this one at a time. So I've got initial research on three other sites that um, one of which will be when COVID relaxes and you can get back in the archives, the next book. Yeah, I mean, that's one of the struggles, isn't it? I, so my, my next book is coming out soon next year. I can't give a date yet, um, but it's going to be, I'm, anybody who follows me is probably sick to death of hearing about it, but it's about a surgeon named Harold Gillies who's the father of modern plastic surgery and who was rebuilding soldiers' faces during the First World War. So I've spent the last four years in the trenches with these guys. And it's it's an incredible story. I hope I've done it justice. Um, but actually, you know, if, talking about process, so I'm a full-time freelance writer. Catherine still is in an academic post. But what happens is, you, is, is a freelancer, you get on like this treadmill. So the moment like you submit, your agent is like, right what's the next what's book next? so i'm not yeah. just talking about like the next i'm actually working on a proposal for like book three now <laughs> so yeah. it just never ends like you just kind of have to constantly yeah. pushing it out there there's going to be five years between my books which is a little too long but i also fight catherine against that academic kind of tendency to you're thorough it, it's yeah been, just keep it stays going. longer on the shelf though Lindsay. i actually believe that if you put more energy in up front yeah That's interesting. i mean it's hard you know a lot of writers you know if they don't get enough as an advance like they have to push them out faster and so there's a lot of like things that might push a book qu quicker but um but it is it's hard and i feel like there's a lot of pressure on writers now to produce really quickly and i think that you know you got to sit with a story you got to become familiar you got to smell the documents as you did um, you, you have to get to know these people that you're writing about if you're going to do that kind of narrative uh, book that the, the kinds of books that we write. So, whoop, yeah, like <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm still an academic. So while I'm doing this book launch, I'm teaching two classes, writing up a colleague's promotion papers. I'm in a hiring committee. So 140 yeah. applications will drop. So I'm privileged and I don't have to worry about the money side. I have to worry about the time side. Yeah. Yeah. Well, so are you hoping to do freelance full one day? You come over to the dark side and <laughs> I am, I'm already planning. <laughs> you're, you're right. <laughs> so while we're talking about writing, can you to each uh, spend a minute talking about your, your daily writing routine or your whatever uh, writing routine? Um, yeah, go for I it, Catherine. Yeah, that. so as I mentioned, you know, I'm still an active academic, so mine is not daily. <laughs> not right now. Um, but when I have leaves and, you know, I've gotten various grants to take a semester off here and there to do this, um, I think it's very important that people 
uh, take some time for themselves, their bodies and rejuvenate. So, you know, I will take, I will have weeks where I'm in the archives and your neck starts to hurt. Cause you're like yeah. this the whole time you're, mm -hmm. you know, and you get out of that and you're trying to write it up as it's going along. But sometimes all you have time to do is collect the documents and then later you have to go and write it. And so I've kind of let it sit for a minute and then I go back and start writing the story part. Yeah, I mean, my most of my days are spent crying, um, <laughs> wondering what in the world I was thinking when I took that. So, I mean, the, this this next book was literally like I kind of I, I I had multiple ideas, and my publisher's like that one, that World War One one, and I thought, oh God, I don't even know anything about World War One. So I've, it's almost like I've had to do like a PhD and then condense it and make it into something that's interesting and um, you know digestible to a general audience, but. I, yeah, I mean, I don't really have a, a process. Most of it's just, I write really early. So once I start finding, you know, stories and quotes and things that I know I want to kind of integrate into it, I start laying it down, but it still takes forever. Oh my God, I'm the slow, are you really slow writer, Catherine? I, I'm so slow, it's ridiculous. I'm not a slow writer, I am a slow reader. Um, so uh, yeah. you, there's one part in the book actually where um, I also have a 16 year old son. So he's home over winter break. This is messing up my writing. And <laughs> I, I make him transcribe the newspaper article. And I talk about that <laughs> and his reaction to that in the book where he's Amazing. like, This is supposed I to be about it. the girl who died and it's all about the stories. What's going on? You know, he's like, <laughs> all about Carmel. What is this? You know, and I thought like yeah. he, he gets it and he just walked in cold, right? So, so there's ways in which I, I reflect act on you know this is the reality of women's lives we multitask yeah no it's it's I, I had a i live in the countryside in a, in a very small village in britain and when i first moved here this woman came and knocked on my door and again no nothing like no bra like it was all pjs <laughs> like you know and she goes and I, I looked at her and she was like oh are you the writer and i was like Yes. And she goes, oh, I just think it's so romantic what you do. I'm like, I hadn't like showered in date. Like there was nothing romantic. I was like, this is a terrible, you know, fate. And, and it's kind of, it's like, I don't have any children, but I imagine it's like the birthing pain. Like you do forget it. Once the book is in oh, your yeah. hands, you're like, oh, it was worth every, it was you, all know, worth it. <laughs> you know, horrible thing that I went through. And then, then guys also, everybody listen up. All you people who leave one star reviews on Amazon. No, don't do that. <laughs> We oh. were gonna die with those reviews on Amazon. Oh, I remember yeah. when the butchering art came out. Within, I, honestly, it was like five minutes of it going live. Someone left a one star and goes, "No pictures." And I was like, oh, my "Read God. it, read the book." You know? Yeah. So oh, you need to go through that a little bit. Uh, but but yeah, I'm looking forward to hearing more about this next book with you for sure. Well, thank you for that. So while well, we're talking about butchering art and the Gilded Edge, let's do our um, our giveaway. Um, I, I've got a list here of the people who are here live, and, and I'm, uh, I'm making an executive decision to, to restrict it to people who are here live with us. All and right. I... <laughs> uh, Kathy, and, and, and that's no discrimination against other people, but it'll be more fun this way. Yeah. Um, uh, Catherine, I'd like you to pick a number, please, between zero, one, one and 60. One and 60. Now here, I wish I had my D and D dice, you know, from childhood. <laughs> oh. <laughs> yeah. I'm going to pick 60. Oh. Hmm. Okay. Give me a moment. So, um, I purposely printed out this list in a very random fashion. It's not in order of when people registered or alphabetical or anything like that and oh i'm happy to see this number 60 is our friend gail rosenfeld who, yeah, uh, gail. Yay, gail. <laughs> oh good i'm very happy to see that especially because gail is a a, a a frequent participant in our um crowdcast so that's very sweet so gail i want you i'm going to put my email address in the um in the chat and uh, if you could send me uh, information about where we can ship your books to um congratulations that was fun and thank you yep. both catherine and we're gonna voice our that. book on you yeah <laughs> love to know yeah like oh okay. god you know no Go and by the way gail it's my book's coming from england so it's going to be slow slow mail i have no control over it but it, once it hits the u.s it seems to slow down even more on that side so well, we've all experienced um, 
mail delays and things even here. Um, let me just finish putting my address in there. And that means of the rest of you, please feel free to write to me. I'd love to hear from you. So let's take another couple of questions. Um, uh, Darian wants to know what was your biggest takeaway from writing these books? And I think that's Is this nice. Darian from Jersey? <laughs> I think he thought he was from Jersey. I was like, I'm from Jersey. Yay. So um, the biggest takeaway, I think we've touched on it, is that we haven't come so very far. Yay, Darian. Um, what exit? Ha ha. <laughs> Bergen County. Yeah, la, la. yeah. So the biggest takeaway really is that um, we need to do more work. Uh, we need to do more work as archivists, uh, highlighting women's lives. You know, archivists do jump in and say, oh, this record is of note. You know, it, you know, just because the person wasn't, you know, candid. Whoop. <laughs> so just because a person wasn't like known like Jack London doesn't mean what they have to say, like their experience of it, a self-administered abortion isn't significant. So I think there's that level. As writers, we have to do more work. I almost gave up because there weren't I thought enough records and I pushed myself to go back and back and to places I hadn't looked. Weird side note, I'm in Urbana, Illinois, which is two and a half hours south of Chicago in the cornfields. Hi, the Indiana person I saw on there. <laughs> but um, when I was like, where could there be more records of Nora Mae French? Because I've been, you know, New York, all over California and Aurora, where she grew up in New York at the Finger Lakes. Um, I was like, duh. Her grandfather was the governor of Illinois and the Abraham Lincoln Library in Illinois, just an hour and a half down the street, had the French Wicker records, which were oh, her yeah. family. Yeah. Governor records. Yeah. And there were the letters of her early childhood. I mean, and, seriously, detective oh, wow. work here. Yeah. And this great Are your, letter. Are your PhDs in English literature or history? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Okay. And her, her, her letter to um, her uncle early on where she explains why she's not going to marry this guy early on. And she says, I know I need to be reformed, but I hate it. It's so uncomfortable. And I was just like, I love this girl. <laughs> yeah. So that was, in, that was in Springfield. Yeah. I mean, you have to wonder what would have happened to her, you know, had she had she lived and, you know, I mean, and, and also just thinking about all the records and poems and things that might have been lost or destroyed. And exactly. You know. And we're right now in a place where we're like recovering women's work and women who did stuff, you know, like hidden figures and all that. But I think at the same time as we celebrate those when we recover them, we also have to mourn what was lost because whether through death or just abominable working conditions, you know, women were not able to do their best work. Yeah. Effort. So yeah, I mean, you know, well, tell them about the the part you told in the story about the banners. I thought that was really cool. Oh, so yeah. So I went to Columbia University in the city of New York, and if you've been there, there's um or you know went there. It's this low library which has you know Homer to um, through Shakespeare through all these male writers carved in the library in into the rock, and. Um, Around the time I graduated, they dropped a banner of women's names. And I was like, ooh, cool. Things are really moving along. But those never get carved in rock, you know? Mm -hmm. And George mm -hmm. Sterling has, despite having been an awful poet, an uh, entire park above, you know, Lombard Drive the in, you know, in San Francisco dedicated to him. <laughs> what? What? Why don't you start, like, a campaign to get something dedicated to Nora? Do you think there would be, I mean... Yeah. Get, get. Uh, that should probably come from the readers, but yeah, I would say when I went to Carmel, there was, you know, and this is a hard read if you're from Carmel a little bit, I do kind of like expose some of the past that, you know, people... Unsavory, yeah. Yeah, that's a little unsavory, but people were very welcoming and generous, and um, if they weren't, I didn't hear about it, but yeah, I mean, there's, <laughs> I think there will be more of an attempt, you know, to sort of look at this and think, okay, what is the meaning of these women's lives, including Carrie mm -hmm. Sterling's, who, without whose labor, basically running a, a hotel... Yeah you know, yeah. this never would have happened. Yeah, I feel like I, I yeah, I feel like there should be some kind of movement to do something more permanent for, for these women. I mean, I love oh, that bit yeah. about the banners and how, you know, the banner came down and, you know, the women don't get immortalized in the same way that men's lives do. And that continues till today. And mm -hmm. in, in the way that we treat female artists as well, it's it's harder. It really is harder to to kind of have that permanence. Um, in fact, and I won't name names, but one of my friends is very 
very, and, and Catherine, you know, are very um, a best-selling New York Times author. And in another male friend of ours, well, she, this this woman sent her author photo forward, and the publisher said, well, it was it, it she looked too good in it, and um, and that people wouldn't take her maybe seriously. And so, did she have another headshot? And we we joked that <laughs> our our male counterpart would never get that request from a publisher. And so we're still kind of dealing with these things. It's like you, the way you present yourself physically, also you have to you know, are people going to take me seriously? if I look a certain way or whatever, if I pre present a certain way, so. Uh, we're bringing glam back, you know, I chose yeah. the old shadow. Exactly. <laughs> Except <laughs> on writing days when there's no glam, <laughs> there's <laughs> nothing. <laughs> Like I take my wig off. And <laughs> it's the whole thing, guys. You don't want to see behind those closed doors, <laughs> like my poor neighbor did when I first moved here. Oh my gosh! But but yeah, I mean, I feel like we could talk for ages about the process and about you know the crossover between academic and commercial and all these amazing things that I feel like more. I I hope more academics actually start doing because these stories should be have put into the hands of general readers and be told. You know, you may know it's not the finest hour for academia. I, I will probably get to another question, so I won't belabor it, but um, I don't know if we have time, but- uh, We have plenty of time. Oh, I, I, we we only have one more question. Yeah, humanities people really have to start, you know, doing more public facing writing. And I'm not gonna lowball the investment of both money and time I put into um, mm -hmm. making work that would appeal to a general audience, uh, but we're doomed if we don't. Yeah, definitely. And I, and I think it belongs there, too. I mean, you have these amazing stories. But I will say this, though, that not all academics have the skills that you have, which is to make a, a compelling sense. You know what I'm trying to say. I was <laughs> accused of school. Um, I was accused of writing too well. <laughs> but but e even though I, I had the spoilers in here, there's still tons in this book. So you guys, I mean, honestly, it is. And I'm not just saying this. And you can look back at all the interviews I've done this year. I haven't said about any, but this is my favorite nonfiction book I've read all year. And it's an unexpected story and you really got to pick it up. And, and uh, especially if you're a woman who's gone through a difficult relationship, it's got it all there. All your rage goes into this book. So, you know, definitely pick up a copy and help an author out and enjoy it while you're at it. So. Well, I could not have made a better pitch than that. Um, and, and we did not pay Lindsay to, to say all those <laughs> things. Um, I, I cannot imagine that uh, at the beginning of this uh, program, if you didn't want to buy this book, that you don't want to now. What a fascinating, good job, Rebecca ordered. Looking forward to it. Um, <laughs> follow the link. My colleague uh, Jacques has reposted it there, so it's pretty easy to get to. Um, so thank you so much for doing this. It's been just fascinating. And I do want to point out that this is um, the first of three programs in what we're calling Pick Your Poison Week mm -hmm. at the Mark Twain House and Museum. So we have uh, tomorrow evening at 7. Ooh, ooh. Yeah, that's going to be great. Deborah Bloom. De Deborah Bloom and Dean Job are going to be talking. Uh, they talked with us uh, earlier in the year, and they're terrific. And then on Thursday night, we have Edward Slinger Slingerland talking about his book, Drunk. So um, please do join us for those, come for our gala. But for now, just let's relish this moment uh, that we've really had this wonderful afternoon talking to the two of you. Uh, has either of you ever been to the Mark Twain house? No, I, I have. Love to. I have, just a few years ago. Yeah, it's amazing, yes. guys, you gotta go. And thank you guys. So when they asked me, I was like, oh my gosh, I get to do an event with the Mark Twain house because it really is fascinating. Um, the way he built the house and you get to go into the sort of back rooms and uh, there were things I thought I knew a bit about Twain. I had no idea. So I love that we're nerding out on this. <laughs> That's so awesome. Well, I hope that you both, I hope Catherine, you'll come back and Lindsay, you'll come see us for the first you. Thank time. You, yeah, um, absolutely. And to. one thing I always say is uh, that the, the Mark Twain house is a, a writer's home and a home for writers. And I hope that you'll both consider yourselves now part of the family of writers uh, in the circle that oh, surrounds great. us at the Twain House. It's been just an honor and a privilege to have you both. And um, thank you so much. And thank you, Gail, uh, for being here. Congratulations on your big win. And uh, thank you to our audience for your great questions and, and the great chat participation. It's been really fun. It's been great, guys. Thanks for, for tuning in. And yeah, I'll, I'll put out links to on social media on how to get Catherine's book. Definitely get it. Get it.
<laughs> there's my order all right then you heard it <laughs> from Lindsay fitzharris all right, guys. <laughs> gonna go i was about to say good night goodbye have a great afternoon everybody bye-bye bye, -bye. bye.